He is a journalist and a broadcaster who often explores the intersection of sports, race, business, politics, and culture. His work has appeared in the Toronto Star, the New York Times, and the Literary Review of Canada. Now he's turning the lens on himself in a debut memoir that explores what it means to be black in Canada, particularly when you have strong black American roots. Here to talk about my fighting family, borders and bloodlines, and the battles that made us is Morgan Campbell. First of all, congratulations on this incredible book. I, I blazed through it in a weekend. Uh, what inspired you to tell this story now? Uh, well, part of it was that I had the time. Like I, I took a buyout from the Toronto Star. So once I got out of that daily routine, and sometimes multiple times daily routine of hitting deadlines, I had some more time to think and get into something deeper. Um, two, it was better to do this in my mid 40s and say in my mid 20s only because you know when you write a memoir that deals with growing up you have to write about your parents and it's you you're you do better writing about your parents when you are a parent you do better writing about marriages when you're in a marriage just because you have a much better idea as a full grown up how marriages work and how they don't sometimes work and how parenting works so i could look at my parents uh with more empathy. And when I say empathy, I don't mean sympathy, but empathy meaning I'm able to put myself in their shoes. How how would I have reacted? How can I write about this person being a parent frustrated with their misbehaving child, which I was, right? And so for those two big reasons, it was better to do it now than uh, 10 years ago or 10 years from now. Now, as the title says, you come from a fighting family, a family that often uh, fought with each other. Uh, you start things off uh, with how there was no amount of love lost between your maternal grandfather, Claude Jones, and your paternal grandmother, uh, Granny Mary, two very formidable personalities. You, you, make, <laughs> you bring them out and you make them three-dimensional in the book. I feel like I know them just the way, by the way you've described them. Uh, how did their, their feud start? No one really knows how it started. All we know is that there are circumstances that surround the beginning of this feud. So what happens uh, is that their families were from the Deep South. So my dad's mom, uh, Granny Mary, Mary Gibbs, she was born in New Jersey, but on the way from South Carolina to Pittsburgh. My mom's dad was born in Chicago, but his folks are from down South, from Louisiana, from Texas. And they all wind up, they wind up sort of in adjacent neighborhoods on the, on the far south, on the south side of Chicago. And uh, same church, same high school, Fanger High School on the far south side. And Fanger back then uh, had a lot of white students, did not have very many black students, but they had a few, uh, Granny Mary, Claude Jones, uh, they were part of that little small um, population of black kids. And in situations like that, most of the black people have to get along just for the sake of survival because you're in this city that's segregated and the white people by and large are hostile towards black people. So you're, and you're this small group of black kids in this white high school. But those two did not get along. Personalities that, well, personality wise are very, very similar in the sense that they both liked control and they both liked attention. And they, both of them liked these tests of wills and these family fights and they would dive into these things as grown up with gusto. Uh, and part of it was this perceived difference in social class. They both came from working class families, but each saw the other family as somehow fundamentally different from their own, even though they were both first generation Northerners um, with working class families. And so it's between their personalities and this perceived difference in social class, uh, it's fertile ground for conflict. And then naturally uh, her son marries his daughter and so now they get to now they get to be linked as in-laws. And yeah, that was fun. Uh, and a feud that lasted decades. <laughs> yes. So, and in still and somewhat we're still talking about it. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, your grandpa Jones, a big reason why you're here. He was a jazz musician on the south side of Chicago, recruited to play in Toronto, where he eventually settled in 1966. Uh, what happened there? That's exactly what happened. He was. Uh, Playing in clubs in Chicago, he wasn't famous, but he was well known on the on the jazz scene in Chicago. And he played a lot of sessions, like in the daytime, people would come to his house and record demos, or he would go to like Chess Records, which is very well known, and um, record record uh, sessions. You know, he record sessions with people like Curtis Mayfield, Mary Wells, uh, Betty Everett. But 
he reached the point where he sort of burnt out on Chicago. There was one summer he spent working in San Francisco. He was thinking about moving there. And then these agents from Toronto, they start calling his agent, trying to see if they can book him here. And at first he's very reluctant to come to Canada because it's he thinks it's far away. Uh, he thinks it's too cold, even though he's from Chicago. And I can tell you between the two cities, Chicago is significantly colder than Toronto is. But he didn't know that. But my grandmother, um, Margaret Jones, she winds up talking him into coming to Toronto one time. And he comes one time in 1966 and he loves it. So then the next time he comes, he has he brings her. And uh, their youngest son, Jeff, who's my uncle, who's also a, a well-known, he's a Juno award-winning musician. And so uh, he brings them the next time and they love it. So then they decide all within the first, second quarter of 1966, that they're gonna move to Toronto. And so by that summer, they're here. And uh, my parents are still in Chicago. They had just gotten married and they moved to, Tor moved to Toronto at the end of 1969. So that was how we wound up here. So yeah, if, but if my grandfather was not a musician, I don't know that anyone else in my family would have thought to come to Canada. Well, you also explain in the book that uh, your own parents would come here for a number of reasons, the assassination of Dr. King, the election of Richard Nixon, and what was happening socially at the time in American cities, this resegregation that occurred with the with the white flight to the suburbs. Were you aware of all these things as a kid or did you come to know that more as an adult? Um, depends on what you call a kid. Young, right? so young like, man, so teenager? By a teenager is 100%. Mm -hmm. You know, by first, second grade, no. Because I, I didn't have the language to understand that. But my parents, they did a really good job of uh, keeping my sisters and I connected to Black American history and culture and the circumstances that brought them to Canada. And so, and, and giving it to us in language that we could understand sort of at each step of the way. So my parents didn't talk to me about race when I was 12, the way I can talk to my mom about race right now. But at each step of the way, they would give us, they put a little more on our plate a little more on our plate. And, um, you know, but by the time I was 15, 16, you know, I was reading James Baldwin and read the autobiography of Malcolm X. I had watched like a lot of these documentaries, black history documentaries, Eyes on the Prize, et cetera, that would air on WNED out of Buffalo that we could get. And my parents would record them, sometimes make us watch them live, but we would also record them and watch them. So by 15, 16, 17, yeah, they could not just talk to me about race and racism and, and, and structural racism in the US, uh, but they could show me how it worked knowing I could understand it by then. But like at six years old, they wouldn't have talked to me that way. But already you knew it at, at, a, at a certain age that there are differences if you if your family stayed in say Chicago as opposed to coming to Canada. Yeah, a hundred percent. And one of, uh, you know, one of the, uh, like a big chapter about a third of the way through the book deals with <laughs> the fact that I was maybe the worst behaved student in the history of Meadowvale Village Public School, at least up to that point. Like I was always in the office, always in trouble with my teachers, always fighting with other kids. Um, and, you know, and I wound up in therapy because I got in so much trouble so consistent, so consistently. And the behavior did not match the standardized test scores because my standardized test scores were very high. And these teachers, uh, they saw some talent in me. Um, and instead of just doing the easy thing, which is just labeling me some, some type of problem and handing me off to some other institution to deal with, uh, they wanted to probe to see why I acted the way I acted. And the point my mom would make to me, especially later when I was old, not when I was acting like that, because I wasn't old, I didn't have the language to understand it. But like at 16, 17, 18, she could sit me down and tell me like, look, if you, if we had stayed in Chicago and you had grown up there um, or any big American city that's segregated with underfunded public schools because we didn't have private school money, um, you might've wound up in real trouble because the teachers might not have had the patience or, or just even if they had the patience and the will, maybe not the resources to go digging for the source of your problem. And that's how kids Talented people just wind up in the school to prison pipeline. But here uh, in Mississauga, uh, at least back then, they had the will and the initiative 
and the resources to connect us with a therapist who, you know, put us all in therapy and told my parents, like, your the so problem with your son's behavior is not your son, it's your marriage. Um, but you know, in another time and another place, we might not have had that. You talk, you mentioned it just now earlier, but uh, as a young man, you read The Fire Next Time by, by James Baldwin. Uh, what does it mean to find your gimmick and how worried were you <laughs> about not finding yours as a young man? Two things. Um, one, there's a lot of Baldwin in this, in this book because he was really influential to me. When I think of the writers that influenced me, growing up, especially those years when I decided I was going to give writing a try. Obviously, the writers I read in Sports Illustrated, because I read a lot of Sports Illustrated, rest in peace to Sports Illustrated, like for Ralph Wiley and Gary Smith, obviously. Um, Pat Putnam, because he wrote a lot about boxing. But um, Baldwin was so influential to me because The Fire Next Time was powerful in detail, but it was also short. And I wasn't used to writing, write, reading books back then. So this book is 140 pages, man, that, 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 that spoke to me. And I'm glad to be able to take Baldwin sort of beyond this social media rebirth that he's had because he had so many like spicy, punchy, powerful one-liners that wind up getting snipped out of larger texts and turned into tweets and Instagram posts. And people think that that's just what this guy was, this cool guy who wore shades and smoked cigarettes and uh, spouted these one-liners. But, but beyond the one-liners, there's you know, a serious body of work, an influential body of work, a powerful body of work. Like he was such an influential writer to a lot of people. Um, and so for me in The Fire Next Time, he talks about the year that he turned 14 and he, you know, he looks around him he looks around himself in Harlem and sees that like the year that people turn 14 is the year that most of them fig most people figure out that life is about to get very difficult with few prospects for upward mobility, unless you find a thing or a gimmick as he calls it. Uh, so, you know, for a lot of people, it's entertainment, sports. Uh, and when Baldwin says it doesn't matter for, he says, and the scary part is it doesn't matter what that thing is. And that's an allusion to crime because certain people like, if you don't have a particular talent for sports or singing, you got to do something else if you want to avoid just having this long, hard, unfulfilling, disappointing life locked in this ghetto. And so Baldwin, he becomes a child preacher at 14. And for me, uh, you know, I read it, I was 15. Yeah, I was, yeah, I had just turned 15. So here I am, I'm like, ooh, I'm a, I'm, I'm a year behind schedule. Now, I didn't live in the ghetto like Baldwin. I didn't live in the hood. He lived in Harlem. And the Harlem of the 1940s, not the gentrified Harlem now, where you got to be making 250 grand just to you know, afford an apartment up there now. This is the Harlem of, of our imagination. Um, and so for me, you know, I lived in suburban Toronto, but I, I, I still thought of myself as like needing to come up with something, if not a gimmick to just, you know, to catapult me out of the ghetto, because those aren't the circumstances of my life, but just something that I could do, do well uh, and be good at you know, that could give my life some structure and bend my trajectory upward. Uh, so like sort of indirectly that leads to me taking sports more seriously, but it also does lead to me like wanting to read and wanting to write. Now you talk a lot about uh, uh, defining a black Canadian identity and, and you lay out a spectrum. Uh, where did you end up <laughs> falling on, on that? Do you feel do you still? No, well, it's not a black. It's not not the spectrum of black Canadian identity. I meant very specifically black Americans that come to Canada and how mainstream Canada and black America uh, interact interact and relate. So, in the spectrum, at one end, there are people, black Americans, uh, that come to Canada just for a short time, just to sort of decompress, regroup. Uh, wait out an untenable situation, uh, plan their next moves, right? So these would be like people that came here dodging the draft that maybe moved back. Or even like people that came to Canada during slavery on the Underground Railroad, and then after the Civil War moved back to the US because there are a lot of those too. Um, you know, I use uh, Jackie Robinson as an example because he spent one year in Montreal and then went back uh, to Brooklyn. Um, and so that's at one end. And on the other end of the spectrum are like hardcore patriotic Canadians who with roots 
black people with roots in the US, but who are really, really grateful uh, to Canada for giving them a second chance at something. Uh, and the historical example I used was Richard Pierpoint, who was a black loyalist who came to Canada in the 1780s as a young man, but also fought in the War of 1812 as an old man. Right? This is how he was in his 60s out here running around with a rifle with the Redcoats shooting at the Yankees, right? Because that's how much Canada meant to him. And so for me, you know, this is, and I'm writing about this as an 18 year old trying to figure out now where I as a black American in Canada uh, fit on this spectrum. And uh, so for me, I was sort of in the middle because I was very, as I note, note, as I note in the book, like I'm Canadian enough to have, you know, drunk milk from clear plastic bags you know, and to have cheered for Ben Johnson to beat Carl Lewis, if, you, if, if your audience remembers that. But I also felt very secure and, 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 and rooted in my Black American background and history and, and, and culture. So I was sort of a border straddler. I was more at the, in, the, in the middle of that spectrum, but with a foot firmly on each side, or both feet on each side whenever I felt like it. And when people ask me, are you more Canadian or more American, I just say I'm both. That's it. Between two worlds, I guess. Yes, but of two worlds. Of two worlds, yes. Yeah. That's better, yes. <laughs> uh, what do you think your story says about the, the Black experience in Canada? Well, one of the takeaways I, I, I hope people take from this book is that there's no one Black experience. Like what we call the Black community, especially here in Toronto, is so multicultural. Um, that the Black community doesn't quite do it justice because it's a group of people who we have decided all share, fit on this range of phenotypes that goes from, say, Dwayne Johnson to Pascal Siakam and like all the colors in between. Uh, and we've said, you guys are all one group. Okay, cool. But within that range of phenotypes, there's also a range of experience, a range of backgrounds people who moved here literally yesterday to first second generation Canadians to people whose families have been here since the 1780s and so I want you know one of the takeaways to be that you know this black community that we describe as one thing is actually a bunch of smaller communities making a community uh, here in Toronto and that black Americans in Canada black Americans in in Toronto uh, we we sort of get glossed over because there are not a ton of us, you know, and so many of the black Americans we see here are people that are here for a couple seasons because they, they play for the Raptors. They play for the um, Argos. Back when there used to be a lot of black American baseball players, they played for the Blue Jays. Um, but there are also some of us who are just still here. Sometimes we find each other and our stories are important too. Our stories, because they're unique, because there aren't a lot of us, uh, that sort of raises, um, the value of the stories, like not not to say our stories are more valuable than the next guy's story, but it does because there aren't a lot of them. Like it helps us to pay attention when we get a chance to tell these stories. You're a dad now yourself. Uh, what would you say uh, your children's experience uh, is growing up black in Canada as as opposed to it was for for you and your sisters? Say? Yeah, well, her experience is going to be different from mine, and that's fine. You know, because she's growing up. I was 42 when she was born, I think. My math isn't good. So she's growing up 42 years later, like a whole generation later. Um, and she's growing up, uh, she's not a first generation Canadian. She's a second generation Canadian. Like both of her parents were born here. So that makes a huge difference because, you know, the connection to the old country, whether it's St. Lucia, where my wife's family is from, or the United States, it's, it's not going to be as strong as our connection as like my wife's connection to St. Lucia because she spent her childhood there or my connection to the US. But I still want to nurture that. But we still want to nurture those connections and let her understand that she's just not some free floating being, but she comes from specific people, but also from people. You know what I mean? You talked about takeaways from the book. Ultimately, what do you hope folks get out of uh, My Fighting Family? Ooh, uh, Again, I just I hope they enjoy the stories just for the sake of enjoying the stories uh, and walk away from it feeling a little bit more informed about, you know, our family specifically and about just about the types of people that, you know, the stories that are lurking behind 
the people they meet. Um, and on the topic of fighting, like you notice as you read the story, there are a lot of fights, but not many clear winners, <laughs> right? Uh, a lot of stalemate, mom, yeah. Yeah, and just a lot of wasted time and energy. Now, is my book going to cure, is my book the cure to pointless family fights? No, but if it nudges someone to uh, reconsidering uh, exacerbating the next family fight, cool. And that's like the closest I will ever help write to a self-help book because I don't, I don't want to write one of these manuals that says, hey, uh, do these 10 things so you can be like me the way like an actual successful person would. <laughs> I don't want people following me. <laughs> but uh, in terms of like just keeping in mind that whatever fight you think you're in and how important you think it is and what you think you're going to do to win the family fight, you're not going to win because <laughs> nobody wins. And so I hope they take that away too. In addition to like all the other things uh, that I'm trying to get across about, you know, the, the unique multicultural nature of Toronto's black community and the fact that like there is a black American diaspora um, and the ways we relate to the old country. My Fighting Family, Borders and Bloodlines, and the Battles That Made Us is published by McClelland and Stewart. My thanks to author Morgan Campbell. Thank you.